but special music was outstanding. Amen. One of my favorite songs. And Patty, you are correct. We're in, the, we're in the Christmas season. December 1. I invite you to open your Bibles to the second chapter of the book of Matthew. The Christmas story is loaded with profound counterintuitive truths that help us to understand the very essence of the gospel. It answers those deep questions like, how can you believe in a God when there's so much chaos in this world? Or, where is God when the unspeakable happens? And what I like is people are so smart, why don't they believe in Christianity? So let's turn to Matthew 2, beginning with verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, of the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who had been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. A little bit of reverb there. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and Jerusalem with him. Now the first thing we probably should do is maybe deal with some wrong assumptions that we have about the birth of Christ. Many of our favorite Christmas songs create an atmosphere that Jesus' birth was calm and peaceful and it was like a precious moment experience. But if you've ever been at the birth of a child, you know how chaotic it can be. Like our system. Like our system. <laughs> <laughs> On June the 12th, there's no volume that we need. Okay, we're back, right? Yeah. On June the 12th, Karen's mother woke me up. It was very early in the morning. And she said, we need to get to the hospital now. And Karen's mother was a nurse. But she knew how to be direct with me. <laughs> the hospital was 50 miles away. So I started driving fast. And her mother kept saying this one phrase over and over, Drive faster. <laughs> she didn't want to deliver that baby. And think about what it must have been like for Mary to be on the back of that donkey near time of delivery. I think it's Silent Night, a song we just sang. Silent Night, Holy Night, all is calm, all is bright. That's a nice thought, but it doesn't meet reality. And secondly, I really hate to mess up your nativity scene. But the wise men were not present at the birth of Jesus Christ. It was months later. In fact, some even suggest that it might have been as much as a year later. You remember, if Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, doesn't say that the wise men went to the manger. It says they went to the house where Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus were. And another one of my favorite Christmas songs, We Three Kings of the Orient Har. Well, there's no words in the Bible that tells us how many Magi's were there. Now, some use the word the concept of three because there was three gifts given. So now we've cleared that up. Who are the Magi? And we, from the word Magi, we get the word magician. But these were not magicians. These were, these were astrologers, these were scientists, men who studied, who studied agriculture and mathematics and history. And they resided east of Palestine, they lived in Persia. And you remember, many of the children of Israel were taken captive, were taken captive to Persia. And they had a profound impact. Remember Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? And they shared with the, with Whoever would listen, the writings of Moses and the prophets. 
and these types of magis would study the Hebrew scriptures. And one of those scriptures they, that they would be familiar with was, is found in Numbers 23. It's the story of Balaam and the donkey. You remember King Balak was concerned that the Israelites might take over his kingdom. And so he had one of his servants contact Balaam. So Balaam was a prophet for hire. And he said, I need you to come and curse the Israelites. Remember, Balaam got on his donkey and began his journey. And an angel with a sword appeared in front of the donkey. Balaam couldn't see this angel. And the angel turned to the right. And without mercy, Balaam began to beat his donkey to get him to go back in a straight line. When he did, the angel appeared again with that sword. And the, Balaam, the angel turned to the left. And Balaam started striking that donkey. One time, the donkey, as he moved, brushed Balaam's leg against the rocks, and Balaam got so mad. At that moment, God gave the donkey the ability to speak like a human. And Balaam was so angry and so intense that he began arguing with this donkey, not realizing what he was doing. And finally, the Lord opened Balaam's eyes to see that angel. And Balaam repented and did not curse Israel, but bless them. And in Numbers 24, verse 17, prophecy in that blessing is, a star will come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It was the promise of the birth of the king. And Zara of Ages tells us that that star that they were following was a cluster of angels, the same angels that had visited the shepherds was now guiding these wise men. When they saw that star, they remembered the prophecy of Numbers 24, and they studied the Hebrew Scriptures to understand the meaning. And God gave them a dream and said, I need, you to I need you to go. And they were kind of like Abraham. They were sent on a mission. They didn't know where they were going, but they were following them. So now let's go to the next major character in the Christmas story. And who is that? Not Jesus. Herod the Great. Not so great. Herod the infamous. Herod was an Edomite. He was not a Jew. He did not have the legitimate claim to be king of Israel. And he was also extremely paranoid and he would kill anybody who he thought was after his kingdom, including his wife and some of his children. The Emperor Augustus said it would be better to be Herod Sal than be one of his sons. Notice verse 4 of Matthew 2. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where is the Christ to be born? Now these priests and scribes were students of the word and should have known that the birth of the Messiah would be taking place. But they didn't know. They were just concealing it. Verse 5 says, They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, so it is written by the prophet. Now the prophet that Matthew is referring here is Micah. And this next part of the verse, he's quoting Math Mark. He's quoting Matthew. Mark. He's quoting Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. And what's significant that Matthew's doing here is that he is referencing Jesus' kingly line. He's reminding his readers the same town that King David was born in, Jesus Christ is being born in. Notice verse 6. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Many of you may remember that the name Bethlehem means house of bread. And the region of Bethlehem was filled with hills and valleys, and they were covered with fig trees and olive groves and grain. Bethlehem was, in a sense, breadbasket of Israel. And remember, Jesus said, Taking from this same concept, 
John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Now you would expect the next verse to say, the priests and the scribes, when they met these wise men, said, let's go to Bethlehem. Is that what they did? No. No, they were offended that these pagans <laughs> would come and tell them the king is born. What a tragedy. Verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. Now the reason that Herod does this is because he believes that the scribes and the priests are plotting to take over his kingdom. So he has a private meeting with the, with the wise men. And then he tells his lie. Verse 8, he went, then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, Bring me word that I too may worship him. Do you think Herod wanted to worship him? No, I wanted to kill him. Verse 9. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it arose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Isn't that wonderful? Now, Desire of Ages, page 63, tells us, At Bethlehem they found no royal guard stationed to protect the newborn king. None of the world's honored men were in attendance. Jesus was cradled in a manger. His parents, uneducated peasants, were his only guardians. Could this be he of whom it is written, that he shall rise up the tribes of Jacob, and restore the preserved of Israel, and he who should be a light to the Gentiles and for salvation unto the end of the earth. Verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child Mary, his mother, and he fell down, and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That was something we need to observe that Matthew's doing here. There are three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all tell the story about the birth of Christ. They all tell the same story. Matthew is focusing primarily, not exclusively, but primarily on Jewish believers. He wants Jewish believers to understand that Jesus is the King of Israel. Amen. And that Jesus is the promised Messiah. So it's no accident... <clears throat> That Jesus, that Matthew starts his gospel with a story of the Magi coming and ends his story by telling us that we need to go to the Magi's of the world and preach the gospel. So Matthew bookends his gospel, showing the nations coming to see the Messiah and ends it telling us that we need to go to the nations and tell them about the promised Messiah. And that nation may be your family. It may be your neighbors. It may be your community. The core of the gospel message is that Jesus has come for the nations. Matthew wants us to understand that Jesus is not a Jewish Savior. He's not a Gentile Savior. He's not a North American Division Savior. He is the only Savior. He is our only hope. There is no hope for forgiveness outside of Jesus. He is the cure for our sin problem. And our mission, our ministry, is to reach out to the nations and invite them to discover Jesus for themselves. Our job is to share Christ and to invite them to love Jesus as much as we do. So we cannot be content in playing church while our family, friends, and neighbors don't know Jesus. Matthew stamps the Christmas story with the evidence that God is in absolute control. Now, God knew that the Roman government would require every nation to be counted and that this would move Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem, just as the prophecy said. Our God controls the heavens. He controls donkeys. 
He controls governments. There's not one square inch of the universe where God is not in control. And when the worst chapters of your life happen, remember that God is in control. The devil wants you to let go. It's like being in the ship in the midst of a horrific storm and the devil wants you to jump out. We need to stay in the ship, the ship of salvation. And when you look at the Christmas story, you have this major contrast. You have these wise men, highly educated, and you have these shepherds, highly uneducated. You have the rich and the poor, both find themselves kneeling at the foot of the cradle. The, the gospel is the most inclusive worldview ever put forth. It brings the rich and poor together. It brings the educated and the uneducated together. The righteous and the unrighteous. Because the gospel recognizes, and we need to recognize, that the only solution to the sin problem is Jesus Christ. Amen. The Christmas story is about the cradle that rocked the world and turned upside down her values. Jesus is God's answer to senseless evil and to my pain. Notice verse 12. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This glorious story has a tragic ending. Herod, realizing that he had been deceived by the, by the Magi, realized they were not coming back, he sent his soldiers on a gruesome duty to Bethlehem to execute every child to and under. I was wondering, how could those soldiers do that? But Matthew was telling us that in the midst of all this horror, there is hope. There's Matthew 2.15. Out of Egypt I have called my son. And Matthew is intentionally referencing the exodus from Egypt, in which God took the children of Israel out of that brutal slavery they were experiencing. And then Chapter 2, verse 18. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Matthew is quoting Jeremiah 31, in which Jeremiah is offering hope to the children of Israel. Their temple has just been destroyed. Their homes ransacked. And they've been taken as slaves by the Babylonians into exile. And their first stopping place is Ramah. And they're weeping and they're crying and they're heartbroken. You know, Ramah is a town about five, six miles north of Jerusalem. And in the midst of this unspeakable pain that the exiles are experiencing, Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 31, verse 16 and 17, one day, your voice will cease its weeping, and your eyes will cease from its tears, for your children shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. There is hope. And that's what Matthew's trying to tell us. Even when the devil seems to be in control, when he's making a, a chaos of our world, Matthew is trying to help us understand there is hope. A king has been born. A king who will change hearts and reconcile people together. Matthew is showing you that Jesus is the ultimate excess that all other excesses point to. He is the deliverance from our bondage of sin and he returns us from our exile from God. Our daughter's name is Wendy. It was not a random decision. It means pilgrim, wanderer. We are pilgrims in this world. 
We are wanderers in this world. We are in exile. And Matthew's recognizing in chapter 2 that although on the one hand there is this horrible news about these children being slaughtered, but at the same time there is good news. There is hope. A new king is born. A king who will conquer death. A king who will heal our hurts. A king who will not exploit, but a king who will pour himself out for us. A king who will reconcile us to himself. A king who will reverse the curse, who will bring back children from exile and make all the sad things that fill our eyes with tears become untrue. The good news is that King Herod did not have the last word, but the new king does. Herod and all the other tyrants don't get the last word. Jesus gets the last word. God is going to take all that Herod intended for evil and overturn it for good. And the joy of that moment will call the memories of the pain to disappear. It's like a mother who gives birth. All that pain she went through, she forgets once that baby is placed in her arms. Revelation 21, 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the older things have been passed away. Isn't that a wonderful promise? All our tears wiped away. All that pain and sorrow taken away. There is hope in the midst of hurt and there is hope in this life. Jesus is the only answer to senseless evil and to my pain. The gospel, says that, that, the gospel says that this is the world, is the way it is. This world is the way it is because of sin. But a new king is born. One who will bring an end to all that because he bore the curse of sin in our place. And he's one day going to come back and restore this world back to the way it was. Those things that we lost in tragedy, we brought back and reunited with us. So again, this is the cradle that rocked the world. And the most profound question in the world are answered by the birth of a small baby in a manger. So as you prepare for Christmas and as you go shopping and find all those crowns, remember the one gift that Jesus is looking for under your Christmas tree? Is the one that says, this is my heart. I surrender to you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, that, that you inspired the gospel writers to share with us the story of the birth of Christ. And thank you for the promise that you will bring an end to all this chaos. Thank you, Lord, that we can be a witness, a witness for you to our families, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our community. Lord, help us to never lose hope. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Lord, we thank you that as you guided these Magi's, that you still guide us today. Help us to keep our focus on you. Not on the problems of this world, not on each other, but on you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.